No, cool, guys. So I'll, I'll try not to uh, talk too much because uh, there will be a big show and tell tomorrow. So, uh, yeah, I guess keep thinking in your heads uh, questions you want to look at and things you want to see tomorrow, and we can entail what we do tomorrow in the sheds, and uh, hopefully it's not raining. Or maybe it should. Yeah. Um, so I think probably the key message uh, I've just heard now is there's a big issue with disc seeders. Um, everyone's sort of saying, you know, you've got less options. So I think one of the key things I've noticed with the disc farmers is they're really attentive to detail. So you've really got to have a plan. So you can't just waltz in and then try and patch everything up later. So uh, when I'm thinking about my system, we've kind of really dug our nails into it and really sort of teased out some of the finer points and tried to go for what Chris was talking, his one percenters, to get that sorted to sort of compensate for the limitations in a disc. But there are discs and discs. Easy. Nice common slide. I just thought I'd put next to this uh, some ticks and crosses of the things that uh, we do and don't do. Um, obviously, uh, we've got five of the six, so I thought I should give myself a pat on the back for that. Done quite well. Um, and the one I wanted to add in was our don't stimulate weeds, which is part of our, the way we run our disk system. Um, I'll just go through each of these and we'll, we'll have a chat about it. Uh, probably the key ones, the harvest weed seed control, which we don't do. So I'll be really interested to see how we go here um, uh, over the next three days and see if there's anything I can do to get this into my system. So there's some innovative farmers like uh, Justin that are, uh, are playing around with this sort of space and Sam. So I'll be really interested to see how they're dealing with it and uh, whether we should go that way or not. But we're sort of pretty adamant we're not doing it just yet, but we'll, we'll see how we go. Um, so, uh, as Kiralee referred to, uh, we have quite a diverse uh, lot of crops. Um, this is not Benito canola. My kids are taller than that. Uh, we, we like to grow uh, hybrids here in, uh, in the Wimmera. Um, that's sort of a bit of a no-brainer. Uh, Cam Taylor's given us plenty of presentations about how you're pretty much crazy to be retaining seed when you could be growing some uh, high-yield, high-vigor, um, uh, competitive canola varieties like that. Um, this is our barley crop we grew, and this was about 20... 15, I want to say, which was the second drought. That was, I did pick the best part of the paddock. Um, everything else was getting nothing, and all our red, red loamy rises were um, absolutely creaming it. So just goes to show that if you get your system right, you can really do well. And there's plenty of competition on 15-inch rows uh, in that barley. That's probably uh, Spartacus. I'm playing around with a bit of safflower on the end. If you do it right, you can get a bit of competition in that, but it is a really tricky crop to play with. A bit of a learning crop we're playing around with here. One of the beautiful things about it is it's just changing um, uh, the, the, the uh, soil um, interactions with the plant. We've got a different species growing in our fields. Uh, we're just seeing if that works. They're working on a new GM variety, which is uh, very, uh, or supposed to be higher margin and hopefully comparable with canola. If they can sort out the 20 years of missed genetic, engineer, uh, genetic breeding in it, um, then it could be a viable crop for our area, especially down south and in the wetter areas. And that's really good for delayed sowing, or sorry, strategic sowing. Um, and there's some beans on, uh, we used to grow them on 15 inch. With the new system, we've narrowed it back up again to 15 because it's just a bit more convenient for us. But uh, yeah, and there's a big part of our program is oat and hay. So we probably have about oh, 35 to 45% legumes in our system, which is probably not that untypical. Probably 45 is near the top end of the mark. Um, that's lentils, um, beans, and vetch. And the vetch is usually just nuked out, um, but we sometimes cut it for hay. Uh, it's probably 10% oat and hay probably 10% canola, and as we've alluded to when I was talking with some guys at, at, at the break, you know, the big problem with things like canola for us is that canola, barley and lentils all want to be harvested at the same time. So there's a bit of a, a rotation fit there where you've got to try and mould your rotation to keep things balanced. And of course, with that much diversity, it's, uh, it's, it's much easier to rotate our chemistry to suit as well. Um, so herbicide management, um, the two we do well is we double knock and we mix and rotate herbicides a lot. Tim's a firm advocate. If it doesn't have about eight or nine things in the brew, then you haven't really got enough in there. So thanks, Tim. Um, he's our agronomist. Um, and we always assume that uh, resistance is uh, inevitable. So uh, we just got to try and delay it as long as possible and keep coming up with new ways and being creative to try and increase the diversity of our system and delay onset of resistance. Um, so here's a bit of a, a little quick tricky of what we do. So we do our pre-sow, we do our, often it's a glyphosate knockdown, and this is after we've done summer spraying, uh, and we'll follow up with a paraquat double knock. Often that paraquat double knock will be mixed in with our pre if the season permits. Our pre um, we do always do a mix if we can, so we mix them up as best we can. Um, I mean, typically, I'll go, I'll go through some of the, one, the brews we've been using. Um, 
but it also, we've been putting them out later. So um, with our disc system, it allows us to put them out just before the crop comes up or just after it just comes up. So that maximises that, that uh, active, active period of the herbicides. So we're finding with things like uh, Box of Gold, which seem to have... Chris, how long does Box of Gold stay active for? Eight weeks? Six weeks? So six weeks, and Sakura is up to 10. So, yeah, we're definitely seeing that where you go out and you put your box of gold down and if you do it and then we have, because we're dry sowing, no, no action for three weeks, then we kind of lose three weeks of activity, almost three weeks of activity, and then the poor box of gold is really struggling to keep its legs. Whereas the Sakura always seems to do well for us because it's just hanging in there a bit longer and we get those extra few weeks of activity to really punish those weeds and keep them under the pressure. Hopefully waiting for that little dry pinch which tips them over the edge. Doesn't seem to work in seasons like this where it's really wet in May and June. Oh yes, yeah, so I guess here we've had very wet, we had no rain essentially up to the 1st of May or the 2nd of May, two above average months, then we've had a, a, a sort of an average month and we're sort of tracking okay if it rains again before the end of this month. So we're looking quite good in, um, in rainfall but that also means our ground's really wet which um, has been a, a bit of a problem with some of our herbicides because they've got a lot of weeds to deal with. Uh, in crop we come with multiple, multiple modes of action wherever we can. Um, in legumes, it's much harder because there's fewer things we can do. So we've talked about how clethodim is, is such an important part of our uh, pulse rotation because essentially it's the only thing we can use for broadleafs, uh, grasses. Um, and broadleafs in broadleafs are, are really tricky as well. So we're really relying on our preempts to do a great job. Um, we terminate, so we then go in with multiple modes of action. So we'll come in and double knock, but we'll also go in, this is to take out our, our vetch uh, or, or our covers, and we'll be coming in with not just straight roundup, we'll actually be coming with multiple activities, actives to make sure we get a good knockdown, melt it down, and then come in with a second one to, to neaten it right up. Um, and then obviously we'll come in with a spray top where we can. So uh, typically we'll always be doing lentils and we'll always do our canola. Uh, and there is an option there to do barley. Obviously, APVMA have re reissued the permit to do it on barley. Um, but then again, I don't feel so good about that with the uh, MRL problems we've got going on at the moment. So I'm always on the lookout for ways of, of, of avoiding using that and leaning so heavily on some of those um, high residual uh, products which the customers don't want. But there's obviously a compromise between farming and not. So um, with our cereals, we're typically going in with a, a Secura box of gold rotation or a Secura pro sulfur carb rotation. So we'll be sowing, um, potentially we'll be sowing two cereals in a row. And when we do that, we'll make sure that we don't use Secura twice, which we'd, which we'd like to do because it works the best. But um, we'll be rotating into box of gold, which usually is in the barley phase. Um, we don't tend to use Treflan, although I hear there's some novel Treflan stuff. So uh, maybe that's a good opportunity at the next session to start grilling a few select farmers about that in disc systems. Um, in the, the legumes, it's uh, much more flexible. We've got more options. We've got a lot of group Cs we can play with. So we're throwing things out like simazine, turbine, diuron, propizamide. And, uh, and then our oat phase two is great because we can, we can actually come in with a different type of herbicide. So we're using like, things like dual gold um, and uh, diuron at really high rates. So this, the, uh, in our country down south, it seems to handle those high rates. But it's quite interesting how we went out and put... Um, the Diaron uh, dual gold recipe out on our, our plains, cow key plains stuff. And as soon as we went outside the, uh, the favourable soil type, there was serious crop damage. So it was interesting to see that what you might see on Twitter and somebody using it, you'll be really careful that it actually suits your soil type as well. So that was a bit of a learning. We, we actually patched out our pre-em in our oats this year to try and um, focus on the ryegrass areas, which we knew were quite selective, but we're just looking for better ways to actually map those areas so that we can actually do that and then spend the big bucks and do these really complex pre em brews, but where they need to be without missing patches like we saw in the last presentation. Uh, and in crop, um, legumes, the big issue, clethidium, obviously, then maybe some brodal or broad strike, but the problem with brodal is it doesn't seem to really kill anything. It just seems to slow stuff down. Immy's the same. It kills a lot of stuff, but the key ones that we get concerned about are things like vetch, and uh, it, just, it just seems to reduce the number of seeds. And that's really not good enough for a, pla uh, a plant, a weed, that's actually going to hang around for seven years or so. We really want to get zero, zero tolerance and get them fully killed out. But, um, yeah, we're still playing in that space. And, and I don't think IMI is necessarily the solution to that. So we've, we've got to kind of work through some other plans. So I'll, I'll show that here in our rotations. So um, this is, uh, anyone want to guess what that crop is? It looks great. It's uh, oats with uh, rye, uh, Paul Lockspray is going to be loving this, uh, some vetch, um, I've put in a nice crop of fumitry, some dead nettle, 
um, bed straw, no. <laughs> Um, and safflower and tillage radish in there. And uh, I think there's actually, I don't know if there's a shot in there, but in there somewhere is spinach as well. So um, I guess one of the things we're looking for in weed set is different modes or different termination dates. So you're really trying to, to muck up your, your system. Don't let nature learn what you're doing. So we're changing when we're finishing things. So hay production, obviously we're cutting that ryegrass off really early, which is the main reason we're doing it. When we got rid of the sheep, when they weren't, we were $300 ahead. Um, we uh, moved to hay production instead and we've been exporting oat and hay since uh, early, probably 15 years or so. And, uh, and that keeps our ryegrass numbers down and we'll do multiple hay crops in a year, like up to three in a row, just to get that seed bank right down and take a pressure off all our other herbicides and then go into a... And we can actually do that with or without a preem depending on how bad the, the uh, weeds are. And then we can go into our other program of um, beans and wheat and canola and, and um, allow the weed bank to come back up again usually. But uh, shielded spraying is an option to do in crop. Um, it's a really tricky one. And uh, tomorrow you'll see the, the, the uh, crop stalker, which will be at our place. Um, we've been using that um, for a little bit. And the key reason we got it was to spray uh, into row in lentils. So when I talk shielded sprayers, I can see two types. There's the Lee Bryant type, which is the one that dangles on the chain and just bounces down the rows, and that's for late applications in uh, cereals. And then you have like the crop stalker, which is really kind of like a legume-based one, where the, there's no crop structure to hold the shield and guide the shield. So you actually need a, um, a mechanical system that can follow rows. So it's really clever, and I'm pretty sure Grant Yates will give us a lovely presentation about that. If not, um, I'm sure I'll be happy to talk about it. Um, but yeah, it's got some really clever software to actually know what a green strip looks like. Um, we haven't been using it this year because uh, uh, it's not wide enough. We went to a bigger machine and we're on controlled traffic. And uh, when you're running an 80-foot cedar, your shielded sprayer needs to be an 80-foot shielded sprayer. And that one's only 40, so it won't fit down the lines anymore without making new wheel tracks. So compromising our system until we get it sorted. Everything's uh, as an organic growth thing. We change one element in our farming system and then something else has to be modified and it's a never-ending uh, thing. The bank manager loves it. Um, so the crop rotation, I think one of the key things we've identified is there's a few weeds that are really persistent, things like vetch and, and wild oats for us. We don't have too much of a brome issue uh, where we are. But things with like uh, vetch, every time we grow lentils, we get a blowout where we get a lot of seed set. So what we're looking at doing is actually doing rotations without lentils, which typically is probably our most profitable crop on the Wimmera Plains, uh, except for the last couple of years. Um, and ironically, the paddock that we've been doing this seven-year program, I think it's the seventh year now, and it's still got vetch coming up, so it's going to have to go on eighth, um, is actually one of the most profitable ones we've got. So ironically, we've removed lentils out of the system. Uh, we've replaced the legume phase with a vetch brown manure, and uh, the, the uh, long-term average return is actually better than if we'd left the lentils in in the first place. So um, go figure. But obviously there's something to going on there with that laying the paddock as a, as a, uh, as a, as a brown manure fellow. And um, the other one we're playing around with is uh, four years uh, without barley because we just can't control the wild oats in it. Topic and things like that don't work. So we're looking at rotations that involve hay oats, um, canola, where we can use the imi. We use imi canola um, usually. Uh, we can do Madovin in wheat, and you also get some activity with the pre -M. Um But it's usually that late germination stuff, like we talked about with brome, that's the biggest issue, is how do you come back? Because we've got these awesome pre -Ms that are doing an amazing job, and then you get a late germination or a late flush, and there's nothing, no tools we've got to actually to deal with that. And that's where we're getting those blowouts, and really we're just selecting for those late ones, which is going to be a, a real pain in the ass later on. Um, so the reason we, we do our brown manure, so that's even shorter termination than hay production, which is great. So we're coming in and, and taking it out in probably early September before it really starts getting into that reproductive stage and sucking a lot of moisture. And in the last couple of years, we've just started playing around with mixing other things into the vetch. So the primary job of this cover here is, is nitrogen fixing, but uh, we want it there for um, weed management at the same time. But we figured that uh, based on what research is going on over in the States, that if we can actually um, get more interaction between the plants, which we saw at the Vic No-Till conference last month, which was last month, yes, yeah. It was, um, it's quite interesting, some of the root interactions that are going on. And so this is a paddock in particular that had low fertility and uh, we're really looking to supercharge it. And we're like, well, we could just grow vetch, um, but I don't feel it's going to get there very quickly. So uh, we um, decided to mix in all these other um, different species, which are supposed to interact in the soil and build that soil biome up. And that'll create a sort of a better aggregate structure, better water infiltration, release more nutrients, yada, yada. So um, we're trying to see if this will help us sort of 
jump a couple of years ahead rather than waiting for our 10 years of no-till to really start kicking into gear. So we're trying to bring these new paddocks up to speed as quick as possible. Um, next one. Yep. So um, this is our CTF hay. So one of the problems with being controlled traffic is uh, how do you uh, make hay on controlled traffic? So in our pictures here, the pointer doesn't work so much by the pointer, but the top right, um, this is us cutting our hay. We've got a front mount link mower on our fence and a swing mower at the back, which we always had. Both have um, conditioning rollers on them, the metal ones. Uh, we have to run down the tram line. If you look really carefully, you can see the tram line he's following down the paddock. He'll turn around, lift the front link mower up, turn it off and mow the other side with the swing mower. So we'll get three passes per 40 foot of about 13 feet. A pass, so we end up with three nice small windrows, which will dry quickly. And then this is the rake, this is the barometer we had before. We've changed this, we've now got a quad rotor, which we feel works a bit better. It makes a tighter windrow and can reach the 40 foot quite well. And uh, just before baling, we pull them together. So we essentially cut it, leave it, do nothing, super condition it when we cut it, and then rake it together in front of the baler. Um, we've got a uh, eight string baler. Um, the beauty of that is it opens up the window we can operate. So instead of only operating for a couple hours a night, we can usually get that going on even those 30 odd degree days. We usually only lose a couple hours a day where we can't bail. So uh, with our program, we can actually keep going uh, for longer during the day and get done what we need done with only one baler. And the beauty of that is we don't bring in contractors. We get it done when we want it done. We know that they're dry and that we know our sheds aren't going to burn down. Um, and the other thing too is when we're raking these 40 foot windows and we, we grow 12, up to 12, 14 tonne oat and hay crops, typically probably it's more like about eight, seven or eight. But um, when you push that together, it just fits under that uh, CTF three metre space tractor axle. So it's just snug. And the, the throat on the baler is, uh, is a nice, um, it's about whatever three feet is. It's, it's, like, it's almost exactly the same width. So when you're putting it up the guts under the tractor, if it fits under the tractor, it'll definitely go into the baler. And the beauty is that it's a full throat, so you're not chasing the windrow down the paddock trying to keep your bales even. It's a full blue. You can just essentially run on guidance. So we can actually run our baler on, on auto steer straight down the paddock because we've cut it on auto steer, we've braked it on auto steer, and the baler can just go straight and not have to worry about wobbly bales. So that works really well. But then obviously the problem with that is you've got to then pick them up. And one of the worst things for wheel tracks and most uncomfortable job is bouncing across the paddock in the telehandler, picking up bales and stacking them. So we went and got a stacker. And I think realistically, a good loader driver can stack as fast as a stacker any day. Um, but what they don't do is they don't bring all the bales to one end of the paddock. So we're probably doing oh, 70, 80 if you're really good, uh, stacking with the stacker, 80 bales an hour getting them to the end, which is enough to keep the, uh, the truck driver happy. Uh, we're bringing them all the way to the end of the paddock uh, and putting them into one consolidated pile. The beauty for the truck driver is that his loader's there. He doesn't have to get out and walk halfway across the paddock from the last stack to go and get the loader to bring it to the new one. So it's much more efficient. So we've probably moved um, oh, six, 700 bales in a day with one driver, just stacking them, driving to the shed, tipping them off, putting them in the shed, coming back. So it's a pretty efficient way of doing it if you can get those sort of little efficiencies out. Now, Anyone who's really attentive would uh, obviously, and the teaser up there, see that the baler drops the bales on the wheel track, and then what do you do about that? So um, let's see if this is going to go. There she goes. This is the most complicated bale shifting device known to man. And uh, we pick it up. It's got a ram lift in there, some mechanical panels to tell it to move. Drops to the side. The reason we do it this way instead of just barging out of the way is we just didn't want to smear any dirt into the bottom of the export bales. Pick it up with the stacker. And she's away. Easy. Not a stressful job at all. And then we stack them about seven high. So over here we've got a, a seven high stack that we're using. So yeah, no, quite a complicated thing. My uncle built it. Um, we've gone to a version now that's kind of pretty robust and doing the job. Uh, it just hangs off the three-point linkage of the tractor. It's not in that shot, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's quite a beast. Uh, we kept threatening to just move to the push bar, but uh, he, uh, he finally pulled his finger out and finished it. It took him a while to, to get it done. So yeah, um, the stacker will be there. The pickup, unfortunately, is at the other farm, so it's a bit hard to move around with that little tractor. So you won't see that tomorrow, but that was it. So crop competition. I thought it was interesting. Uh, Chris had a really great presentation about crop competition. And uh, I think uh, one of the penalties we have in our system being CDF is 
we're on 15 inch and 15 inch is 15 inch and we can't really change it. Um, these are two pictures taken this year and I just thought it was really interesting to see the difference between Planet, which is fantastic. Look at the coverage on that on the, on the left there. Uh, Spartacus, pretty good, pretty good. So I think the key thing is that on 15 inch rows, which is actually narrow for anybody who lives up north, but for here it's, it's quite, quite wide, if you have a, a highly competitive crop, which is through good nutrition, um, obviously picking variety helps, you can still get that competition if you do it right. Uh, I think uh, that one's actually uh, north-south. That one's east-west as well. So, <laughs> But, I mean, we're not going to change the angles of our paddocks to, to, to suit that. It's just not economic for us. Um, but I think the key thing is that you've got to keep that crop healthy. And then in those dry years, there's no way we're going to get canopy closure in, in our system. But at the same point, you're also not going to get the weeds because it's too dry, so they're not going to come up late. So what we want to do is um, preams have gone out. They've done their job. They've got the, uh, they've got the weeds suppressed. We've come in with our, with our mixed pack to, uh, to control all the broadleafs and whatnot, and it's at that point that we just want that crop to explode and fill in. So things like canola are amazing. So it's like get your end on, get it bulked up, get it to canopy over, get it to cabbage, and stop that uh, any successive generations wanting to come up in, in late germination. So we're kind of working on that principle, that if it's a, it's a wet good year for growing crops, it's probably a wet good year for growing weeds. If we can get the competition in there, it'll help. So really interesting to see where Planet's going. Hopefully this is the year that it shows its legs. We've had it for a couple of years, but we really haven't had a year that could test it on how good it really is. But um, I think it's going to be a much better fit than Compass. I think Compass is a bit of a ridiculous variety. I don't know why they persist with it, but it's just, if it's not malt, it's not malt. Uh, Planet is going to be malt, so that'll be fine. And um, the other thing too is, is where we're going with the Spartacus varieties. I think we need something that's more like a, a Planet Spartacus, an immi-tolerant um, leafy variety. Um, the other ones we're playing around with, obviously I've mentioned the hybrid canolas, so we're big on hybrid canolas. They grow this tall, they cabbage out massively, they easily fill 15 inch rows, especially down south like where Sudolces are. Um, great crops for, for, for suppressing weeds, especially in those high ryegrass pressure areas. And you have that ability to put out some really good immi rates, which are really suppressing the grasses before that, that cabbage phase. As long as you can get them up nice and even and don't have gaps due to slugs, snails and whatnot. Um, and, and dry sowing is not great for canola either in the Wimmera Plains we're finding. It's really tricky and fiddly for us with our disc system to get a nice even strike. And the other one is, is, is Jumbo 2 lentils. It was really interesting to see, was Chris, you were talking about lentils being bulky. Yeah, it, it's, they definitely do seem to make a difference. If we can get them to canopy up, that's great. But then obviously you've got the disease pressure risk to offset that with. So um, Jumbo 2s with their disease resistance seem great. The only problem is that the Jumbo 2s we're struggling with is their, their herbicide tolerance. So they're pretty uh, intolerant to seas and everything else. So um, we're finding that the older Jumbos are, are better on that respect. So we've got, the, got to weigh up the two games. We sowed Jumbo 2s when we sowed early. So we sowed them at bean time, about the 16th of April. It didn't rain till the 1st of May anyway, but they came up early. The other lentils went in at standard time uh, in sort of towards into May. Uh, and uh, that way we didn't have to worry so much about the disease pressure, but we really wanted to get those Jumbo 2s up and canopied over. Um, and you'll see too that to get nice even stands like that, you need to be really precise with your seeding. And so tomorrow when you come and see our seeder, um, we spent a lot of effort thinking about how to get perfect germination or as close as possible to that. Um, so yeah, it, it's attention to detail at that seeding time because that's when your maximum potential is. When you drop those seeds in the ground, you're only going to have lower yield from then on. So you're always just trying to maintain that performance. When we do our hay too, we often sow um, 15 inch, but we do it crossways, which is a bit illegal against the CDF system. But if it's on this softer country, we tend to interrow it. And so we're getting seven and a half. A little bit tricky to do, but it does bulk it up pretty good. Um, and that gives us a good stand for competition and for um, hay making without touching the dirt. Five minutes? Am I done? No. I'll give, you two. give me two minutes. Cool. All right, so additional comments. Um, in our system, uh, some of the other things we've been playing around with, so obviously I love the clean seed comment. That's a really big thing. We found out with lentils, you'll be really careful with your lentils because the seed cleaning systems that you run with, like uh, the truck guys, don't necessarily get that lentil, the, the vetch seed out, and so you're actually sowing back the vetch that you got out. So you'll be really careful with how you clean your seed. Um, Border spraying, we do that. We also move to and fence line spraying. We also actually go into mowing roadsides. So we actually mow them rather than spray them because that's just encouraging um, well, uh, something we'll always want to grow. So it's okay if it grows on the roadside as long as it's not coming over the fence and throwing seeds into my paddock. So we avoid cooch breakouts by glyphosating everything on those. Um, definitely use full rates. 
We do test for resistance. We also run a minimum disturbance system, which you'll see with our um, disk. The aim between that is to actually get um, the seeds undisturbed on the surface where they weather. Little ants might decide to take one home. Hopefully they eat it and don't just bury it and make it grow. Um, and CTF helps. So I want to really show you here, which is what we were talking about with our disk system. So we used to have, this is the standard daybreak disk uh, here. And there's a little tiny bit of soil disturbance there. And for me, that's too much because we were getting weeds striking there. So then we moved to, this is the one my uncle custom made, which is a much more shielded boot. And you can see there's no soil throw at all. That was great. That was working quite well. Uh, and this is what our twin disc can do. And so you can see in that system, there's essentially a strip about two inches wide that's actually disturbed and the rest is completely undisturbed. And we're finding with that in our system that if we don't disturb it, um, we're getting far less strike of the weed seeds that are left behind. And that's how we deal with um, it rather than... Uh, having less strike means there's less for the herbicides to deal with. And also, too, you've got the direct toxicity on the seed um, with the... Um, with the uh, herbicide touching seeds if they're exposed on the surface. And uh, I think also you'll find that the disc seeding guys are pretty aggressive at what they do, so they're really particular to attention to detail. So I think that's one of the things you've got to consider when you're looking at the system, Sam. And... Uh, <laughs> picking it. Um, so this is our wheel. This is what I was talking about with our disturbance. So the top one is we've renovated it with a flat track. It's a stubble. Um, it's got quite a lot of uh, ryegrass weeds there and you can see in our beans beautiful strike in the wheel track as you'd expect we've disturbed it got them coming up but then down here this is not renovated this is actually the wheel track right here and this is all standing stubble this is all a mess of ryegrass growing amongst the wheat and where we've just run the uh, the outrigger wheel on the cedar has done that so that's just the outrigger wheel on the cedar has stimulated weeds there There'll be just as many weed seeds here, but there's none growing. So that was what we've noticed in our paddocks and why we've gone for our system with this minimum disturbance. But it's all farmer for farmer strategy. And the other thing we're playing around with is um, precision tools. So obviously we've got a precision uh, shielded sprayer, but the next thing is to do, look at things like uh, summer weed spot spraying. And I think this, this uh, AIC, which uh, we'll hear from later today, is, uh, is pretty cool because it's actually gone the next level above a weed seeker. Weed seeker is a pretty primitive brute force tool really nowadays, um, whereas this is much more sophisticated. It has the ability to go in crop. And I can see that as a great fit for things like vetch and bifora and stuff like that where we're in the crop, we're willing to sacrifice a small patch of crop to get that weed under control for that year. And I can see that if we could do that in our vetch every time, every time our lentil phase come up, if we could spray our vetch out of our lentils, it'll only take a couple of cycles and we'll have the vetch eradicated because we can control it in the... Um, in the wheat, the cereal phase, quite comfortably. So I've done really well. That's surely got to be close to time. But yeah, no, so tomorrow, um, think of some questions, guys, because there's plenty to talk about tomorrow as well. Thanks, Kiralee.